Hi there and welcome to Into the Nothing with your host Patrice Douglas. Oh, Into the Nothing. I feel like it's surrounding me. Everywhere I go, I feel like I'm in conversations with so many of my friends, so many of my friends that are entrepreneurs who are just experiencing this place of feeling like they have to let stuff go and sit in a spacious place that feels really uncomfortable because like, ah, oh, that business that I was doing or that partner or whatever it is, it's just not working anymore. And I'm just so excited that I, it's so interesting because I, I truly believe that whenever we start a project, whenever we put our stake in the ground and say that we stand for something like I have with this concept and this podcast of into the nothing, we get initiated into it and it just turns up everywhere and everywhere that I'm out of alignment with this concept of trusting, not knowing a trusting space of, of letting stuff go. It's just coming up. It's literally, it's just, I can't avoid it and it's everywhere. And today I am feeling incredibly honored because I have a powerhouse with us today and such an important conversation to have around into the nothing and looking at it from so many different lenses. Because for me, I'm just so, so bloody curious. I'm so curious as to what it means for different people, different leaders, high achievers. Like I'm like, every time I speak to another, you know, uh, a visionary or like a left of field leader, they just, they've had to do this so many times of just like letting so many parts of their identity go and just sit in the discomfort of going, I'm in nothing right now. And this woman has a really powerful lens of neuroscience, which is, I'm going to be honest, I've been in, I guess, a spiritual place for a couple of years and I'm being really called into a science place. And to be honest, it's all the same thing, <laughs> which is so cool. It's just different terminology and different language. But this woman is a neuroscience practitioner and through the principles of neuroscience and functional compassion, this woman, Michelle, facilitates spaces where safety and connection foster embodied self alignment. And Michelle Beatty is a woman that I met through some powerful women, some friends of mine. And one of my friends, Hattie Boydell, she kept staying at my place up in, in Brisbane and we'd just be always sitting on the couch together. And she's like, Oh my God, Patrice, you have to meet Michelle. You have to meet you. When you, when you meet Michelle, you wait, Oh my God, you too. And she just, she said it to me so many times. And then I was fortunate enough to be on a a birthday call with one of my dear friends, Nick Bradley and Nick and Hattie have a business together. And, um, you know, how's he, how the universe works. Of course, Michelle is on there speaking from a, a neuroscience lens. And I was just like, Oh my gosh, this woman, there's something about her, her resonance, her embodiment of her work. And the beautiful thing about the beautiful thing about Michelle is when I, I love to feel into the people that I bring on conversations and podcasts. Like when I was in the shower before I was like, how does Michelle make me feel? How do my, how does my guests make me feel? And honestly, my whole body feels safe. My whole body feels grounded. My whole body feels, I just feel like I'm here. I'm so present. And it's so interesting because through conversations with Michelle, it's all about safety. It's all about feeling safe. And I'm like, well, she's the, she's the bloody embodiment of her message, of course. And so Michelle Beatty, thank you so much for joining me in the conversation of into the nothing. You have multiple businesses that just speak to so many different people about neuroscience. But the thing that I love about you is that you make neuroscience very tangible and very like human. And for the average mind who doesn't know a lot about science and neuroscience, you make, I'm just like, Oh, okay, I get it. Which is so powerful. So thank you so much for joining me and us and all the listeners. And the first place I want to start. And the first question is Michelle, can you describe a time in your life where you have been, I don't know if you were forced to, like your soul was just like, girl, it's time. Or can you just speak into a time where you had to choose going into the nothing and whatever that feels like and looks like for you? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast, Patrice. I'm super excited to be in the space. You know, mm. and, and to pre-frame before I share a little bit about my story, I have to name that this feels a little bit like sitting in the nothing. 
you know, normally coming on a podcast, we might have a structure, I might have a plan. We talked a little bit about beforehand and I noticed my system go, what's it like to be in this new space? And here we are having this flowing conversation. Mm-hmm. I'm tuning into my system. You're tuning into yours yeah. and landing in this safe space. So to, to feel into that, really appreciate the opportunity. Mm. This idea of neuroscience, you know, it's a catchphrase. It's clickbait. It's all over the place. It's mm. everywhere on social media. And what's so cool about it is it's fascinating, right? It absolutely describes and explains everything that is to be human. Mm. All of the things that we experience can be viewed, understood through the lens of neuroscience. But here's the problem, Patrice. Mm. Knowing the information about neuroscience isn't necessarily how to use it and how to apply it. Mm. And my own story reflects this. I grew up in a super academic space. You know, my dad was traveling all over the world, teaching at the top schools, and I was a top academic and top student. I was in super high level competitive speech and debate and speaking on a national level to represent my country. And I was pretty clever. You know, I had a brain. I was hardworking. I was motivated. I put in the work. Like, I, you know, there was a level of competence there that when I hit a few emotional bumps in the road in my late teens, I was able to push through, right? Positive thought, change your mindset. Mm. Yeah, just overcome by just reframing the thoughts that bubble up from these parts of the nervous system that at that point I didn't know existed. I felt the thought, I could change it. That was a pretty effective tool. I'm still an advocate for mindset work. But then in my early 20s, after a couple of years of this, you know, problems become more sophisticated. Mm. I had a couple of bumps in my teenage years. We're moving out. I moved across country. I met my husband. I was feeling pretty isolated in Australia, trying to make ends meet, not having a lot of money, working at a vegetable shop. And I remember one weekend, my husband went away and this feeling of terror, I, I couldn't shake it. I was so scared to be home alone by myself for two days. It was something I hadn't experienced before. And, and I remember my husband left and, um, for a boy's trip. And, and I sat down on the couch on the Saturday and thought, this is an important conversation you need to have with yourself, Michelle. Mm-hmm. You think you're so clever. you got a big brain. You work hard. You can reframe any thought that bubbles up to something that's positive, but you're still unhappy. How are you so smart and so hardworking, but you can't think your way out of this? And that, one of the most humbling moments of my life, and at the same time, such a deep catalyst for me to start examining where is the blind spot? Mm -hmm. Thinking is important. Positive thought is important. Mindset is important. But there are things that it cannot attune to and cannot fix. So... That left me with some pretty big questions, Patrice, around what's missing. And it led me down this incredible path of discovering neuroscience, starting to understand these deeper layers of what's occurring in our nervous system. And that thought, in fact, is only 20% of our experience, where the 80% of our experience is actually, actually driving and actually running the show. Well, that's in the body. That's in the body. Mm. So here we are today, oh. working in a couple of companies and sharing the lens of neuroscience, not just what, but more importantly, how we apply it, how we use it in our day-to-day life to impact and influence how we feel about ourselves and also how we feel and understand the world around us. Mm. Gosh, something that I love that you said, Michelle, which has just like reminded me that those moments where we just sit in the discomfort of our emotion or our feeling, because you know, that moment where you sat on the couch, you Mm -hmm. could have easily not sat on the couch and gone into the kitchen and kept yourself busy. Mm -hmm. Or you could have jumped on maybe today for me on maybe a lot of people that are listening, distracting ourselves with social media or something to not actually sit in, but something really called you in that moment to go, no, no, Michelle, it's time to have a conversation with yourself, Mm -hmm. like the real conversation. Was it just that you reflecting on that moment, would you just feel so overwhelmed? Did it just get to a point where you'd say, I can't ignore this? 
Yeah, I think at that time, without having the language that I do now, yeah, it was certainly a moment where I knew time and time again, I'm hitting a ceiling, I'll try. I'm hitting a ceiling, I'll try. I'm hitting a ceiling, I'll try. And, and you know, through that process, I think there's an escalation of our experience. We have parts that feel, well, first they're disheartened, right? And then they feel a little bit upset. And then, oh, they're starting to feel frustrated. Mm. No, now they're feeling angry. Now they're feeling desperate and scared. And in that moment, at that level of ex- es- escalation, there was terror, which is, I don't know how to be my, by myself anymore. Mm. And I've run out of options. I got nothing left. Mm. And I still don't have a solution. So I'm not sure it was, it was uh, just coincidence, Patrice, that it was that moment. I think there was certainly an escalation of increased yeah. emotion and then suddenly going, I'm, I'm out of ideas. <laughs> There's nothing left. What do I do? Yeah. And, and it's in that. I love it because it's, it is the catalyst. Like when we start, I, cause I've, I can so relate to that, that feeling of like, and I've obviously, I, I, not obviously, but I haven't had that awareness of the escalation, but I'm like, now when you're saying it to me, it's like a full remembrance. I'm like, Oh my gosh, yes. The escalation every time when you try and avoid it and you can feel the niggle and you can feel the whisper and you're like, Oh no, it's fine. Oh no. Oh no. And then you get to a certain point where you're like, can't ignore. Well, there's something really fascinating, fascinating from a neuroscience lens in that, Patrice, because and does it feel okay if I share some neuroscience around this? Please, go, yeah, go. Okay. I love it. Yes. Great, great. So so some basic for our listeners right now is that our brain is broken into three different sections. Yeah. We've got part of the brain where we experience thought. In the middle, we've got the part of the brain that experiences emotion and perception. And then the bottom part of our brain, the oldest part of our brain, our primal brain, our reflex brain, that's where our survival defenses show up. That's important to know Mm -hmm. because sometimes they're not all communicating with each other. And in fact, when we feel threatened, when we feel unsafe, when we feel desperate, when we feel uncertain and unsure, all qualities that every single person listening is probably very familiar with, when there is enough of that, our thinking brain shuts off. And what's operating is our emotions and our reflexes. Mm. And when there is a level of danger or discomfort or uncertainty, which all of us are familiar with, there are five reflexes that our system will try out to try and attain safety. The first one is fight. Yeah. Let's push through it. Let's just do more work. Let's do it faster. I got to do this, right? It sounds familiar to you, Patrice. You got some fight part in there. Yep. What's the next? Yep. And when that doesn't work as well anymore, the system's feeling tired. What comes next? Flight. Mm. I'm going to avoid it. I'm going to procrastinate. I'm going to distract. Oh, maybe I'll try a new idea. Oh, maybe I should be an employee again. Maybe I should try to find a different way to safety. Mm. The third one is freeze. And that's where our system is so activated that we can't fight. We can't push through anymore and we can't procrastinate and flight and get away from it. And suddenly we panic. Mm. Things are feeling totally intense and a little bit too much to handle. Mm -hmm. The fourth one is collapse. And that's where our system just can't do it anymore. Mm. We can't push through. We can't avoid because it's too big. We've frozen up and suddenly our system goes no more. How might we experience that rock bottom? People experience that as yep burnout, rock bottom, I just can't. And then the fifth one, not as important for our conversation here is around attach, Mm. which is reaching out for help and asking in a particular way. Mm. So when you, when you speak to that, Patrice, in this escalation of our experience, most of the time people are in a place where they feel trapped, where they feel unhappy, where they feel unfulfilled, and their system is going through this process. Oh, I'll just push through, it doesn't matter. Oh, I'll just distract myself. Oh, shoot, now I'm panicking. Now I'm burnt out. What am I going to do? So this might be a process that occurs over five years or 10 years or 15 years or perhaps a lifetime. But unless our system has gone through and figured out that doesn't work anymore mm. or our system will often just keep cycling and just be stuck in that perpetual loop. Does that make sense? It definitely does. It definitely does. And I'm like, Oh, I, I know I've got a favorite in there and I've also <laughs> experienced all of it. I'm like, Oh, I, you know, I love them all. And, sure. and so the question that's coming up for me right now is what do we do? Is it, is it wrong to feel these, to, to experience these? Like, 
what happens? Like, how do we get out of it? How do we move forward? Like, how do we be with our body? And there's a few questions there, but yeah, well, the first question essence. that stands out is, is it wrong? Yeah, absolutely not. In fact, this function in our nervous system, these survival defenses, most people have heard of fight or flight. Yeah. Some people perhaps have heard of freeze. Most people have not heard of collapse and attach, but all of these survival pathways have kept us alive. We have a 100% success rate because our survival brain has kept us alive. And this is happening every single day, right? If we're walking down the street and a bus is headed our way, our brainstem, before we can even process and think, is going to get us off the road, mm. right? You can meditate all day long. You can be incredibly embodied, which I'm a supporter of, and we're going to talk a little bit about later. That's really important. Mm. But if a bus is heading your way, you are not going to sit down and journal, <laughs> I'm going to sit down and meditate and contemplate, should I move left or right? Yeah. You know, this function of the brain, the lower parts, the primal parts, they are lightning fast. They create a reflex in the system that will save our life, solve a problem in the short term, faster than we can be consciously aware, mm. right? That's necessary. We never want it to go away. It's never going away. How, how powerful, sorry, just quickly, Michelle, just yeah, because I feel as though this conversation, I'm excited because it's going to lean to like, how do we be with it all, you know, because, and firstly, um, you know, from my experience of, of experiencing these emotions, which it can be so overwhelming and so uncomfortable, you just want them mm-hmm. to just fucking just not be here. Mm-hmm. And if we can just for a moment, just stop and just go, how grateful can we be for this incredible function that's in our bodies that's actually saving us from being hit by buses or all these things. It's like, yeah, I just wanted to point that out. Cause I'm like, just, just to pause for one moment go yeah. while we work to like work with this system and also move forward and live our best lives and like push, like meet our edges at the same time, just, whoa, what an incredible intelligent part of the body. Whoa. Um, it's absolutely genius. Crazy. You know, even when we don't know it exists, it still has a back. Yeah. And I think when I think about these parts of my system, Patrice, oh. the more I learn about this, the more I'm in spaces where I'm working with women around this, the more I've studied this. It's just phenomenal that we have that from the moment we are born, actually before we're born until the day we die and perhaps beyond, depending on what kind of conversation you're having there. So just phenomenal that we have that available to us. And at the same time, oh. It's super tricky because this is where it gets really interesting. And, and I have a smile on my face right now. It's a little bit of a chuckle, right? The good old brain stem, the good old brain stem that exists. This is a primal part of the brain. It's what lizards have. But in addition to that, mammals and then humans have more sophisticated parts of the brain that are developed past that. Why is that important to know? Because the brain stem, although it takes in information and it also creates reflexes, it doesn't make sense of or organize or prioritize the information it's taking in. Mm. Right? So I'll explain why that's, why that's significant. When the brainstem takes in information, it's just responding to overwhelm, reflex, overwhelm, reflex. It's mm-hmm. very, very quick. It's very efficient. It's incredibly effective. When a bus is coming our way, that's what we want. However, in day-to-day life, things are a little bit more nuanced and more complex than that which is we might be experiencing overwhelm, but it could be internally, it could be externally, it could be sensory, it could be emotional, it could be cognitive, it could be relational. The brainstem doesn't know how to organize where the overwhelm is coming from. Mm. It just elicits a very simple reflex. It, it's not able to organize, okay, I'm overwhelmed, but this person that I'm talking to is actually safe and they're my friend and they're in my corner. The brainstem doesn't know how to do that. It just knows overwhelm, respond. So with the complexity and nuances of how many people we interact with, the kinds of levels that we interact, the moral aptitude that we're working to follow, the personal pursuits we're trying to achieve in being or or sharing with the world, the brainstem isn't equipped to be able to evaluate that or prioritize what kind of reflex it needs to have. It just has one. Mm-hmm. Okay? So that poses as a problem, right? We have a brainstem that's having a reflex. And then we've also got the nuances of day-to-day life where we go, well, it's not so simple as just running away. Mm. It's not so simple as just pushing through because you can't push through forever or you're going to collapse. And if you collapse, well, what then? 
when it puts us in a pretty sticky position and a catch 22. Mm. So you have a question around, well, what do we do with that? Does it feel okay if we, we move into that? Please, yeah, it feels like, yeah. Of course, cool. so what do we do with this conundrum? We've got reflexes that are amazing that totally have our back, but not nuanced enough to be able to respond to the ongoings and the daily pursuits of trying to be morally apt, but mm. as well achieve the things that we want to achieve in this life. So, so what do we do that? What's really cool about the nervous system is when it's communicating in an integrative way, right? When these reflex parts of our brain are communicating with the very top parts of our brain, something called our prefrontal cortex, when they're in communication with each other, things slow down. Mm. And when things are slower, our nervous system can process a ton of information at once. Mm. Not only can it process that, we tap into being able to prioritize, being able to connect with morals, being able to socially engage with people and take cues from other mm. people around what is safe and what's not. We also tap into functions of the brain that allow us to build new neurons and change our behaviors. All because of two things. One, our PFC is online. Number two, our system is slowed down enough to process the nuance of information that the brainstem cannot, that mm. the brainstem is just having a reflex to. Okay, is that making sense? So oh my gosh, it just, I was just like, yes, got it. That is cool. cool. I'm so glad that landed because it's a lot of sophisticated information that we're simplifying here. Yeah. Um, let me know if you're following. So, so we've got pathway two, brainstem is having a reflex, gets things done really quickly, but not super sophisticated. Yeah. We've got pathway one, our PFC is online. We're able to process more information, prioritize, navigate, moral mm. aptitude, social engagement. Right? Mm -hmm. They're both really important. But for day-to-day -day nuances, we definitely want our prefrontal cortex online. We definitely yeah. want to be able to social engage with people and learn new things. So that begs the question, how the hell do we get our PFC online? <laughs> right? Was that, am I reading your mind here? Yes. <laughs> cool. Okay, so how do you get your PFC online? There is a reason why mindfulness and meditation and tuning into our systems and tuning into our body is so popular now. And with the emergence of neuroscience, we see that this is not just magic stuff. This is not just woo-woo stuff. This is, and it can feel like that for sure, but this is hard science. When we tune into our bodies, when we are mindful, tune into our senses, when we are able to understand and navigate the signals that we are getting, that builds neurons in our PFC, which allow us to regulate these very, very quick reflexes that the brain stem might otherwise just shoot off. Mm. We can slow things down and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Am I actually safe right now? Right? Is there a bus heading my way? Or, or am I just feeling tired? Am I just feeling confused? Am I just feeling isolated and alone? Mm. And if those are the case, what do I need to do to help resolve that first? Mm. Right? That sounds like a cognitive activity, which takes us back to the very beginning of our conversation. But that cognitive activity, Patrice, being able to prioritize and plan and make sense of, that is the result of a system that's communicating with itself, where we're connecting our prefrontal cortex with our body, mm. right? That cognitive practice can't happen if we are not tuned into our body first and all three parts of our brain are speaking with each other. Does that mm. feel clear? Yeah, it's just, it's just so interesting because this, this whole concept of into the nothing and, and something that it's that I'm so passionate about is space yeah. and slowing down. Mm -hmm. And that is because I had so much energy pumping through my body through, I, you know, I guess I could give it a label of feeling anxious or like overly excited or overwhelmed. Like it was like all of it at, at once for a really long period of time. And particularly when I started up my own fully left my corporate job, and started up my own business, you know, the pressure that we put on ourselves for it to be a success immediately to earn the same amount that we earned in our corporate job immediately, like all of these things, you know, and wearing so many hats. And, um, you know, I just got to a point 
where my partner had a really um, huge accident and um, he was in a coma for a month and I had to care for him for a few months. And it honestly, in my, in my body, I was, it wasn't a conscious thought, but my body was like, Oh, I'm so excited that I have an excuse to stop the way that I was actually doing things. You know, I have this and permission. permission. Yeah. Through this, through this big life event and it just created this, this event, you know, I became so focused on just supporting Ted and let my business go. But at the same time, when I wasn't caring for him, I was doing things to like work, like understand myself and work on myself in the space. You know, I think part of that, I think was probably distraction from what was going on. But at the same time, I think there was something in me to go within. And I think there's, there's, I think many things can be playing out at the same time. Um, And so but I just, I just loved the feeling of spaciousness because I felt so overwhelmed in my system and in my mind and overthinking that I just became so committed to space and slowing down. And, and I just, it's, it's been a challenge because I've, all, I've put, I haven't almost, I've definitely put space and nourishment in front of anything else in my life. And then asking that my business and what I do in my life fits in with that priority which is a process to go through when our society is so primed for busy and distractions and filling every moment and un- the unwiring and the unraveling of the hustle and do, do, do. And I had that I had to do all of these things to have a, a business that made me feel really good. And I got to work with clients that I loved and, and have a, an income that made me feel really good unraveling all of these concepts of what I was told that I had to do or should do in like by the entrepreneurial business world because I really just want space, Mm. but I also want to, I want to be in my passion and my purpose. So, but the slowing down and the unwiring of being so wound up has taken me time and commitment every single day Mm -hmm. because I wanted that ease in my system. And I'd love to just ask you some questions around what's going on in the body. Like what's going on in terms of our hormones and how can we be held ourselves with grace and, and compassion or, or what is your advice? Cause I know you work with a lot of lots of high achieving individuals and, yeah. and you have lots of containers and groups of women where you support in this creating space and slowing down and what's actually happening. Cause it's, it's, it truly, I've had to be totally committed and devoted to it for well over a year and a half now. And I'm now reaping the benefits of it. Yeah. Patrice, the first thing that I, I want to share with that is, is some compassion you know, I, I really hear from you how much work, and I, and we only know this much, right? We can hear it in your voice, but at the mm. same time, you live your life, just like the gals that are listening in right now. And, mm. and I really want to affirm and acknowledge that I'm so sorry that your system had to go through what it had to go through. That's the first thing that I want to share. Mm. I think it's important that we don't skip over that. Because I hear the work from my system to a validation for the people listening that it's so wonderful to speak about space it's so wonderful to be on the other side it's so wonderful to feel potential and opportunity but the level of intensity the level of struggle the level of holding and containing that it takes to get there Mm. we can't skip over that all well and good to say we're grateful but at the same time it's really fucking Hard. Yeah. So I want to acknowledge you in this and me and everyone listening. The second piece is to hear you say that you're practicing this every single day and have since this really big turning point in your life makes so much sense to me. From a personal level, hell yes. From mm-hmm. a neurological level, it makes sense. Right? What happens in our system? when it is developing survival defenses is when we are little, when we're teenagers, particularly developmental parts of our life or times of our life, our nervous system will take cues socially that if I fight and if I have a fight survival defense and that helps keep me alive, there is a, there are neuromodulators and hormones that are released to help ingrain that neural pathway. If I avoid, if I find something else to do, if I turn away and that has kept me safe, well, that's what's going to keep showing up in our life. Mm. Right? If asking for help, if shutting down and shutting off, if 
one of these survival defenses has served the purpose of keep, keeping us alive, that's actually what's going to show up when our system is feeling stressed and overwhelmed. And what's really interesting, and you spoke about how our society is, how most people are, most systems are responding to each other, is that there is speed and there yeah. is pressure and there yeah. is intensity. Yes. And back to what we were speaking about a moment ago, when we have speed, when we have pressure and intensity, the likelihood that our brainstem is going to have a reflex is way higher. The higher the stakes, the faster things move, the more likely we're going to have a reflex response. That reflex response is what our system learned when we were little that kept us alive. Right? It's incredibly efficient that our nervous system is able to do that. And this is happening whether or not we know this stuff. So this is pretty tricky. Mm. Right? We've got ingrained pathways that our nervous system has gone. Like I'm the CEO of the system here. And I've got us to this point. Like who says somebody else is going to take over? Like I'm the boss. I've got the success rate, right? So we've got this neural pathway reflex that's ingrained. And then we get signals outside of us as well, everywhere, everywhere, yeah. that things are high paced and fast and high pressured. And that is reaffirming the signal that our nervous system needs to have a reflex, right? It's coming from all angles. Yeah. So I say that to normalize that if you're experiencing this in your system, of course you are. I would be surprised if you weren't. Mm. I felt it, Patrice, you felt it. I would contend everybody listening has felt this. So this idea of slowing down, the first is, we talked a little bit about it before, how do you even do that? Mm. Especially when it's coming at all angles. But number two, when or if we get there, Okay, let's say we're practicing mindfulness. Let's say we've got permission. Let's say we've got support. Let's say we've got all the factors that help us slow down and create a little bit of space in our life. There is a moment where we experience space that all of the stuff that might have been minimized, that we didn't have room for, that we haven't processed yet is going to come up. Mm. What might that look like, feel like, sound like? Uncertainty self-doubt, not good enough. I should probably be doing something else. I'm wasting time. Sound familiar? Mm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. That's what comes up in space because mm. that's what the nervous system has been working so hard to block out. And I'll tell you why. Does it help if we go over some theory on this? Patricia? Please. This right is, this is amazing. Awesome. Okay. Okay. So when this stuff comes up in our system, right? Uncertainty, self-doubt, parts of us that question. One, it's serving a really important purpose. That's a survival defense too, to go, we should be better, or you should work harder, or you should get up off the couch and go do the thing, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a mobilizer there. But from a survival perspective, this idea of self-doubt, this idea of I'm not good enough, from a survival perspective, if we were in the middle of the desert and we were being chased by something, the least effective survival defense would be to sit down and say, oh, this sucks. I'm really not good enough to outrun this lion. Mm -hmm. And our nervous system knows this. Our brainstem knows this, right? So when things are high pressured, when our system's overwhelmed, it's less likely that we're going to sit in a space that allows our emotions to come up and for us to experience it. It is more likely we're going to go run for the hills, Get out of here. Keep pushing through. It makes more survival sense. The human race wouldn't exist if our nervous system wasn't programmed to do this. Mm. So when we kind of, when we compete with this and we start to swing things the other way, which is we're in the middle of a desert, metaphorically speaking, and we're going to sit and just see what comes up. It goes against every survival signal there is mm. because that could potentially be dangerous. So that's the first thing I want to normalize. The second thing is, for that stuff to come up can once again create panic. Oh, I'm not good enough. I should probably fight. Oh, I feel unworthy. I should probably fight. So we've got this really intense feedback loop mm -hmm. and resistance to even just staying in space because in space, all this stuff comes up. It's really, really tricky. It's a catch-22. Oh, yeah. I want to check that's making sense there, Patrice. It definitely it makes, makes it definitely makes sense. And and yeah, I, it, that's why I said, you're so right. You know, it has been a daily devotion. It is daily practice. Like 
to to sit with myself and to even you know i've been meditating now since like 2017 and i'm in i'm in a place now with my meditation i have the most beautiful um female bodywork meditation she's just all sorts of incredible things rebecca thompson and um i'm at this point now where in my meditation i'm going into this place in my in my awareness of of spaciousness of nothing like i it is so it is there is nothing there and stillness and when i first started to get a taste of this place i was like oh that's boring because i'm so used to being mm-hmm. stimulated i was like what is this all there is that's yeah bullshit. there's a part of you that's like yeah yeah for sure i'm like isn't there more if isn't if if this is the you know from a spiritual perspective if this is the truth of who we are i'm like what but then the more that i have you know called myself back into that place and i really want to i my one of my favorite words is practice because it truly it's all the practice and there's nowhere to get but particularly over the last few months, I've really like the moments I felt my mind pulling me out of that spacious place. Like, Oh no. Okay. You're done now. It should be over now. There's things to do. And really in that moment, having that awareness to just gently bring myself back mm-hmm. and the practice of, of that. And I just wanted to speak into this, into this practice of practicing and just noticing because as Michelle was just speaking, so in depth of, of the loops that are happening and and all of the systems that are so wide and they're protectors and doing an incredible job it's just in that moment and i'd love for you to speak into this michelle from your perspective and your lens like in that moment what's the first step is it just noticing that you're in that pattern and how do we notice that when we're it's so you know i know for so many of so many patterns it's just what i'm living it's just what i'm doing so you can't see outside of it until maybe you you have someone to reflect it back or it just becomes so uncomfortable. You're like, wait, life, surely life can be different from this pattern. You might not even use those words, but surely this life can be different from how I'm feeling. And so what's the first step? Because, you know, just that practice of pulling yourself back, it, it takes time is, is the first step noticing. I know you have an incredible community and, and course called the art of noticing, but can you speak into what's the first step, Michelle, when we when just like, okay, This is super uncomfortable. I was trying. I was like, I'm going to sit in space and then all my shit comes up. I'm a piece of shit. I'm not good enough. Oh my God. All these feelings that were so underneath the surface. Like, can you, can you talk us through? Yeah, I think so. There's two pieces there, two pieces that I think are the best resources that maybe our listeners can take away. Cool. And the first one is that when we are able to simply notice Mm. sensation or a thought or an emotion, what that's doing is switching our PFC online, right? Which is like, it's almost too, too simple. It's almost too simple, right? Mind boggling that oh, all we do is notice. Mm. What it's doing by noticing is switching on the part of the brain that helps regulate by default these things that can feel quite scary. Mm. We don't necessarily have to regulate them in an active way. When we simply notice those are the building blocks for our nervous system to regulate them in a particular way. So that's the first thing, right? Just notice. But the second thing, which is the most important anchor, right? Because we can notice, but if we don't understand what it is we're noticing or how we're noticing it, there is certainly a chance that our nervous system is going to respond to that as a threat. I tune in, I notice tension in my chest that can amplify a reflex to say, my body's dangerous. I don't want to go there. Space is dangerous. I don't want to go there. In fact, filling in space and time feels safer. So I'm just going to keep doing that. Mm. Which when we break it down this way, I go, how resourceful that a system goes, not, not that way. I'll just keep doing this. Mm. Right? It makes sense. So there's the second piece. First is to notice and the PFC online, we're building new neurons. But the second piece is safe social engagement. And this is a little bit more nuanced, right? We have something called the social engagement system in the brain. And this is our ability to attune to each other, like you and I are doing right now, as our listeners are hearing our voices, their social engagement system is being active as well. It connects to all of the little muscles behind our eyes and our face. So when someone smiles, we smile. When a caregiver frowns, when we're little, we frown. When they speak, they speak. This allows us to learn things, to mirror each other, and is the foundation of human connection. It's our main driver. It's also the thing that can dysregulate us the most, like the most powerful anchor. So we have our PFC online by noticing, but safe social engagement has a couple of aspects. 
And that is, as we start to notice something, right? What do we notice in our system and how do we notice it? Much less why, but what do we notice and how do we notice it? Mm. We need safe social spaces to be able to make sense of what it is we're learning. So neuroscience is one of those options, right? To go, yeah, that's your brainstem. It operates in this way for this reason. I got one too. What about you? Mm. And to hear that can feel incredibly grounding for people. It's one of the reasons why I love this work. Mm. But then there's another element as well when it comes to safe social engagement. And that is normalization. It's also how we learn. And this might be an unpopular truth for people listening today. There's a lot of talk out there that we need to learn to love ourselves mm. before we love others. Here's the thing. Our nervous system isn't built that way. As a child, we do not learn to love ourselves before someone loves us. It's not how we build neurons. It's not how we learn. We receive before we give. It's how animals and mammals are built. It's how human beings are built. Without safe social engagement, regardless of how old you are, how smart you are, how clever you are, how functional you are, you cannot build new neurons unless there is a give and take, unless you are able to safely receive. And that might be as simple as listening to a podcast. Mm. It might be working with a coach. It might be going to a mindfulness class. It might be doing some sort of course. could be anything. But that is a form of safe, safe social engagement to normalize, to make sense of, to validate experiences that we notice when we switch on our PFC. That loop, tuning in, and then having validation and connection, tuning in, validation and connection, that is how our system feels safe and in effect if our goal was to sit in the space and be okay with what comes up. Those are the resources you need. Phenomenal. Wow. Oh, I, I, I've, never, I've never heard of that before or never thought about that, about, you know, receiving. And, and it's I, another friend of mine, um, Jessie Ryman, she's an incredible businesswoman and just wildly herself. And um, I really love her because she, I, she is in, in extraordinary at breathing belief into people. And I look back at my own journey. She always reminds me of incredible mentors or managers in different companies and things like that that just breathed a bit of belief into me. Like I, I stood up and I said, oh, I'd love to do this. And they're like, yeah, you go for it. Or maybe asked me to go for a few coffees so that they could, sh you know, share some of their wisdom with me. And, mm -hmm. and in that, like, you know, just breathing belief. And I just, the power of loving someone else or, you know, so often, cause like, you know, within a lot of, spaces it's all about believing in yourself which i 100 percent and, and loving yourself i'm the biggest advocate but at the same For time sure. to breathe belief into someone to love someone else mm -hmm. or let someone love you and breathe belief into you particularly when you're in this uncomfortable place like when you know for example if we can use the scenario of a woman being in a career right now where she's just like, holy shit, if I really look into my future and if I'm still in this place in a year's time, mm -hmm. five years time, surely like there's more to life than this shitty job, this nine to five with these people that I don't click with, with like doing spreadsheets that don't excite me. And there's maybe there's a yoga teacher inside of her or, or someone wants to explore neuroscience science or something you know, to just have those, have those moments. I love that to connect with other people, to, to validate and to know that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. Your stories are valid, but also something I'd love to speak into Michelle is, is the nature of stories too, because we can get really caught up in stories in, you know, like the, yeah. does this making sense to you? Like, Powerful the, question. Powerful yeah. Like question. what's going on? Because I, I 100% I'm, I'm, I love being in spaces and I, I'm, I intentionally put myself in spaces where women and men, but mainly women, we can really just share. And like, just like I have so many incredible spaces where women just like, Hey guys, I was going to say like some of my friends who have kids, like I just need to just express that I fucking don't want to be a mom today. Mm you know, and, um, you know, in my, in my relationship, I'm like, I just want to be single, like, and I love him with all my heart. And so there's the stories and, and I think it's important to be able to express them and let them leave the body and, and let the butterfly fly. I like to say, 
but at the same time connecting with the truth and and what's got what's what is the core what is the purity of the of the essence of what's for example if we can look at the scenario of a woman in a job right now where she doesn't love it and she's really caught up in the story of like maybe the manipulation in the office and that's why mm. whereas i believe there's probably something inside of her going you're actually this there's a next chapter for you there's actually more but getting caught up in all the stories sure. rather than does that make sense and taking action from that place it does can, can, we, you, can i speak to it please yeah really cool lens we've already talked about it a little bit already in code but these different, these three different parts of the brain, Patrice, your thinking brain, your emotional brain, and your reflex brain, they mm -hmm. respond to specific questions. So when we ask, what do we notice? That's tapping into your PFC and your thinking brain. Right. When we ask, how do you notice that? Right? Are there sensations? Is there heat? Is there tension? Is there uncertainty? That's tapping into your brainstem. Okay, okay. the top and the bottom, what and how. But then there's this piece in the middle, which is all wrapped up in our social engagement system. It's called our limbic system. And it is what creates meaning in our life and allows us to connect with people. Okay, our limbic system, our emotions, so important. That same part of the brain also gives us perceptions on what is good or what is bad. Mm -hmm. What we like or what we don't like. Mm -hmm. What feels like love or what feels like abandonment, right? This is high stake stuff, which is why, of course, when people start out on something is a really common question of know your why mm. when we ask the question why it invites activation from our emotional brain to say because i love my family because i'm scared of rejection mm. because i'm these are all emotional drivers that can trigger adrenaline to get us to do things but here's the tricky thing there might be an initial motive, right? Know your why, because it can get you to move, yeah. can get you to take action. But when this is a perpetual question, right, this idea of stories, well, why do I hate my job? Why am I so uncomfortable right now? Why am I? It makes sense that our system asks that question because we want to make sense of stuff. Mm. More so than that, we want to identify a threat so we can move away from it. Why do I feel so bad? It must be my partner I should probably divorce my partner. Mm. Why do I feel bad in a job? It's because of this. I should leave my job, right? There's a whole cycle here that's showing up to get us to move away from things that are scary mm -hmm. and move towards things that feel good. But what can happen is this. When we incessantly ask the question, why? For reasons that make sense, because we want to make sense. What we're doing is reactivating again and again these intense emotional drivers. Mm. Why do I feel so upset? Is a trigger for feeling upset, which can trigger our reflex brain to fight or flee or freeze or collapse. Not the most useful question if we're stuck in a loop. Mm. Because every time we ask that question, we're going reflex, overwhelm reflex, overwhelm reflex. So that's generally what's happening when people are quite stuck in stories. They're very upset at things. They feel paralyzed. They can't take action because their emotional brain and their reflex brain just keep looping. Yeah. It's too much. Mm -hmm. We're just eliciting so much emotional flooding and the reflex brain freezes up and we don't end up doing anything. Is this something you've experienced, heard of? Yes. The women you've worked with, very, very common. Mm -hmm. We're simplifying things a lot, asking the question why elicits emotion. Mm. And then a reflex to get away or to fight. And then we shut down and then we're stuck and we go through that loop again. So what's the solution to that? It is, again, turning your PFC online, but in, in particular, focusing on two questions. And that is, what do I notice in my system right now? Mm. And how do I notice that? You notice the question of why is not in there. Mm. And Patrice, I had to do a lot of training around this. Because in cognitive behavioral therapy, in mindset work, there's a lot of focus on why, which is great as a driver, not so constructive for long term. Yeah. You know, when I think of my early 20s, it's because I spent seven years asking why, analyzing the shit out of everything, and yet not knowing what the constructive solution was. So what's the difference between what and how? You tune into your system. Let's say we're in an office. We're not happy to be there. What do I notice in my system right now? I feel tension, I feel panic, I feel heat, 
I feel like my legs want to run out the door. Well, how do you notice that? And what happens next? Well, I notice that it moves through my whole body. I notice that when I'm in the lunchroom, I feel it less. But when I'm on a call, I feel it more. Mm. We're starting to collect data, right? What's happening there is we're getting a sense of boundaries in the system. What feels safe and what does not. Very different to why, which is all the stories of trying to explain it, mm. as opposed to being in the present moment and going, oh, actually, it might be this person. Or it might be when I feel rushed. Or it might be when I've had some stuff in my relationship and at work, suddenly things feel incredibly overwhelming. Yes. We're starting to be able to map out what's actually going on, mm. how we experience that. And with that clarity slowing down, you'll notice, with that clarity and slowing down, we start to be able to identify what do I actually need and what do I need to let go of. Mm. Really hard to identify when we're supercharged with emotion. But with our thinking brain and our reflex brain, if those are switched on quite well, we can start to decipher it's not everything. It's not my whole job. It's actually X, Y, and Z. Mm. There's something I can do to change that or fix that. Or do I need to call it quits? Yeah. Wow. Gosh. And, and again, for anyone listening, I can, I can feel my old, my, my, my system, it's like I love to, I think, being wanting to get so much done and maybe high achievers can relate. It's just like, okay, I want to be an expert at that now. <laughs> you know, I just want to be an expert at that tomorrow because I want to figure everything out. I want clarity in five minutes around my whole life and I just want to drop into the space right now that this takes time and practice and so much kindness and grace when you realize like if you are going to to start this practice of noticing and asking these two powerful questions that when you fall off the horse you know because we will do we will so many times is in that moment the judgment and the anger that can happen it's like oh my god you know yeah i know you better know, you know patrice that that idea of falling off the horse that's just your brain stem Right? The hallmark mm. of the brainstem is speed. When we experience haste, when we experience right. speed, we know our brainstem is being activated, which means something doesn't quite feel safe. Mm. So instead of the strategy, which is kind of jumping the gun a little bit, the strategy of, oh, just slow down, sit in the space, just stay there. There's a precursor to that, which mm. is how do I help my brainstem feel safer so that can organically occur, yeah. which is super nuanced. It can't be rushed because rushing is brainstem. It's going to happen. It's just, it's going to happen. Yeah. That's how we're built. So yeah. But this idea of safety, PFC online, mm. social engagement, time and practice and patience, reaffirming these loops, my God, transformation can occur at levels you'd never imagine. The mm. mantra in this space, in the space of AON in the neuroscience world, slower is faster. Mm. Slower is faster. I love that. Slower is the PFC, faster is the brainstem. Very, very cool. Oh, I feel like that is such, my whole body is just like, that feels like such a beautiful mantra to close out this conversation, which I'm just like, oh, I've learned so much. And, I, and for me, so many pieces that I've kind of understood or been curious about or they're in my awareness, I feel like they've all just landed so beautifully. And so Michelle, is there anything else you would love to share with anyone? You know, the advice that you give to the women that you support, you know, because this is this kind of practice that I've been doing in my own way from different perspectives. It is, it is really who you become in this journey and all of the beautiful things that happen, like in terms of laws of attraction and, and magnetism, when we slow down and we understand ourselves and we, have trust and patience and it's just it's infinite how I, how I believe how our life gets turned on by these practices but is there anything that a key piece of advice that's coming up in your body now to share for for women who are going to start looking to practice this or just are curious on how to feel better well what i'd like to share is i have a huge huge level of respect and compassion for every single system that exists on this human planet 
Mm. I really have a sense after so much personal work, academic study, professional work, is that every system, every human being is doing the very best that they can with the tools that they have. And to validate that, that it's normal, that it's human, that we can be clever and functional and amazing and so competent. And these parts of our system that feel uncertain, that are unsure, that need to rush, that have had to rush and had to survive, that they also need validation and acknowledgement mm. too. We can be totally proficient and we still have a brainstem that might feel panic and unsure and unworthy. And all of that is so okay. It's not going away. We never want it to go away. Our work really centers on what helps the system feel safe enough that we can acknowledge and hold all of that, be okay with it, explore it, be curious, have chats about it like this <laughs> and be oh so human. Yeah. Humanness. I love it, Patrice. Mm. I love it. I'm in it with you. I'm in it with our listeners. Yeah. Phenomenal thing to be human. Yes. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us mm. on Into the Nothing. Thank you. It has just been, wow, just wisdom bombs and gold nuggets galore. Mm -hmm. And so ironic, Patrice, because we went into the nothing and there's just so much there. It's everything exists there. <laughs> everything exists there. And so um, much there. Michelle, what's the best place for people to follow you and find out more about you and the work that you do? Easiest way is directly through Instagram. So if you yeah. hop on over to Michelle Beatty, Embodied Industries, you can send me a message directly there. We work with women in leadership mm -hmm. who are wanting to learn more about their systems, more about neuroscience, but have a tangible and supportive community to be able to map that out yeah. and use that to improve their lives. So straight through Instagram, shoot me a message. You can contact me directly. Mm, and just to, just to round out this conversation, just the mantra that Michelle shared of slower is faster and there's nowhere, where are we rushing to? Where are we going? And we get to enjoy the journey. And even in the discomfort, there is enjoyment. I've experienced it myself. So thank you so much, Michelle, for coming onto this, into this conversation mm -hmm. and yeah, please everyone go and follow her. She thank is you. filled with wisdom. Thank you. Bye.